What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. Hey friends, welcome back to America Trends. I'm Larry Rifkin. John Krofsik is with me. And John, you talk about a dog-eat-dog culture out there. I've got a newsflash for you, John. If you're an American and you work in some kind of organization, the dog that ate the dog has been eaten by a bigger, badder dog. And so I don't want to growl about this, but it's tough out there. I mean, it's really tough. It's very tough out there. I think. I think the uh, the competition is is really hard because uh, you know they're you got to do more with less with most companies these days. So it's really a tough environment. And you're worried. Not only could you be replaced by a machine that has artificial intelligence, though you thought the guy next to you was artificially intelligent. Uh, now the machines are doing that. Or you may have to hire somebody from around the world who's going to be taking your job, and you're asked to retrain them, as we saw in that 60 Minutes piece. So you just don't know. From one day to the next, you come in, and all of a sudden, a life that you thought was rather certain and a path that you had now has become strewn with all kinds of obstacles. Well, I think that's why a lot of people don't take vacations anymore. Americans have not yeah, taken vacations yeah. because they're worried about leaving their jobs and uh, Bob replaces them. Don't worry. Well, look at all the places <laughs> you and I have worked over our long careers. I mean, how many of them would you say, really, John, when you're looking at it, were well-managed? Um. <laughs> Well, I had some good managers. Let me put it this way. I worked for some very good managers. But, uh, you know, I, I think the higher up the CEOs, I, I you know, it travels down. And a lot of uh, stuff wasn't the way it should have been, really. But they were making money, so it didn't make a difference in those days. Yeah, but can that continue? I think that's the question that a guest that we're bringing on about the future of what organizations have to look like, uh, not only to really succeed, but also to succeed in ways that is going to multiply the impact they're having in their markets. It's not just about cutting uh, to a new profit. You've got to care to a new profitability. That's what Shubir Choudhury is saying. And this guy is a really incredible management consultant. He is. Uh, yeah, I'd like to get him over in here and uh, have a talk to us. <laughs> for America Trends? <laughs> for just America for our Trend. small organization? For us, yeah. but no, but he's this saying that more. a lot of people may think that it's all about the bottom line or that it's all about processes. And he's been writing about these processes, John, for so many years. And I think he has come to a new realization that he missed something along the way and that every new book about management forgot something really important. And that's the people within the organizations and how they really can get your attention and how you can maximize what it is that they're doing by caring about them a little bit more. Right. Well, if people are happy, they're going to work better. But why would a consultant and all these management gurus and all these business schools not get that? Yeah, I don't know. Now, that's, <laughs> that is the question for Sabir. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to be asking him that very shortly here on America Trends. And I've got to tell you that this book is remarkable because it really does get into wonderful stories that amplify the point that he's trying to make. But what I love about him is his self-deprecating way that although he has saved companies billions of dollars over the years, he sold so many books, he has uh, helped so many people, and he's so esteemed in his field, and yet he feels he's made some mistakes or has not really had full realization of what makes a company go. Yeah, he felt like he missed the mark there for a lot of his career. and But I guess he's making up for that now because he's figured it out. 
Absolutely. The book is called The Difference, and it's really a wonderful book to read and very easy for those of us who are not management consultants. And I'll tell you, I know that I've worked in many organizations, and I've seen really good teams, and then I've seen teams that have been a mess. For me, the way I always looked at it was, what about the turnover rate? What about the burn over, uh, burnout? What about anger? You could sense that in various teams that just were not working harmoniously. And yet you saw other teams, even within the same building, somehow they had the right leadership. But oftentimes they were being buffeted and impacted by so many of the other teams that were dysfunctional and they tried to develop their own moat or their own <laughs> island. But it's really hard to yeah, do if the entire organization is not going in the same direction. Right, That negative energy just it, it, it kind of transmits through the building. It really does over time. And Shabir is going to help us to understand how you build that caring environment. And he's got this star concept, straightforwardness, thoughtfulness, accountability, and resolve. And trust me, folks, we're not just talking about feel good here. We're talking about somebody who wants to make companies profitable, but he recognizes that there's a human touch and component to this that perhaps has been missing in many of the other guides to better performance and peak performance. And he really wants to make certain that that issue is dealt with going forward. Yeah, well, let's let's get him on. You want to get him on? Let's get him on. Well, you think he's available to us? I mean, he must charge thousands of dollars an hour. Can we afford to bring him on (laughs) America Trends? Money's no object. Money is no No, object. object. When you have none, it's no object. (laughs) Hey, we're podcasters. And, you know, there's so many podcasts out there today that are dealing with the issues of how do you make money in this podcasting? (laughs) Well, more importantly, we want to share some great information with you. And uh, we couldn't think of anybody better to bring to you today than Shabir Chowdhury. With us, of course, is uh, Shabir Chowdhury, and he is just an incredible resource for us today on America Trends. And your wonderful new book, The Difference, you find that there's a lot of waste in the companies you consult for. And I'd really be curious, what are they wasting most? Is it talent, money, results? Uh, First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I sincerely appreciate it. And I think the question you asked is, is a brilliant question, you know, so... Ideally, you know, it's all of the above, and 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 let me tell you that you know, as as you mentioned, that I I have been in in um, consulting in in mostly Fortune 500 companies, but also some uh, small companies as well as I work with the government too. And what I've seen is that there's a lot of you know um, waste with respect of how the processes are broken. Most of the time, the because I'm one of the world's leading expert on the process improvement. So I'm sure you heard of Six Sigma uh, process improvement yes. touted by Jack Welch. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm one of the leading authority on that field. So I come in, and most of the companies come in to fix those processes. And on the process, you know, when those processes are fixed, you know, those are broken processes, make it better. Then what happens is that that affect to the bottom line. So I literally saved billions of dollars. In fact, recently, just most recently, one of the U.S. automaker in 16 months, I saved them two billion dollars. <laughs> right Remarkable. so yeah and that's what that's what i do but what happened is this particular book is so critical because if you really think about it in america i kind of call it as an america has a disease of you know quality disease that means americans never figure it out you know the importance of quality and why quality is needed so we always continuously strive for the be, you know for the better quality right there is few individuals made some phenomenal contribution and we are very lucky and one of them is Steve Jobs one another one is is Elon Musk you know some of their product they make sure not only it is good but is also a good quality right mm-hmm. and uh, but historically historically majority of the time we find that we don't give that much of attention to quality so what happened was when I've been saving these billions of dollars to a lot of these companies, what, what, you know, after doing it for you know, 15, 20 years, I suddenly hit the wall. And the wall is why one company, like two same size company for the same industry. Mm-hmm. So suppose GM and Ford in automotive industry, or you know, suppose those two companies, suppose both of them for the sake of discussion hired me as a consultant and then use 
the same process what I was touting, right, to them. And they're using that. And I've been teaching both of them, and both of them I'm consulting. One is getting only 10x return. Another one is getting 100x return. return. And I was puzzled by that. Yeah, what is the difference? That's what what you asked, and that's the title of your book. Exactly. What is the difference? Why? Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So initially what my human reaction was, maybe I'm a bad teacher. Maybe my process itself is flawed, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe we are not teaching it, uh, you know, uh, our teaching methodologies or the tools are not right. Then after all this soul searching and researching and everything, what we found out, no, it's nothing to do with the process itself. Who used the process? Process is used by the people. So the difference is the company which is getting their 100x return made their company culture. That means that company has a better caring mindset culture. The company which is getting 100x return, that is a caring mindset culture. I call it as a caring mindset culture. That means majority of the people from the bottom to the top, majority of the people have a caring mindset. The company which is getting only 10x return using the same process, they don't have the caring mindset. So then the question comes to, what is caring mindset? So I have been, last five years before I read, wrote this book, I've been researching all these different organizations to try to understand regarding what are the human attributes each of these individuals are missing. And the beauty about it, of my discovery, what I found out, all of those elements, I, I talked about it in caring mindset, any individual at any profession, at any level, you don't have to be a CEO to practice caring mindset. Mm-hmm. Even if you're a janitor, you can, you can, um, you know. Uh, well, you use mindset. the example, of course, of, of the reaction to a toothpick on the floor, and what that tells us about the culture of that company. Uh, use that uh, parable for us. Oh, <laughs> that 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 is a true story. They, I appreciate that you mentioned that. I I was um, invited uh, by one of the Fortune. Uh, 500 companies, uh, uh, vice president of quality. Um, and as soon as I walked in to his office at 8 in the morning, um, and he, um, he, he looked at me, and, and as soon as I handshaked him, he, he was kind of, it appears that he's very down. And, uh, so, and the day before, the J.D. Power report came out. So and that company didn't do well in JD Power report. It's an auto company. Mm-hmm. So he looked at me and he said, "So I kind of asked him. I said, hey, look, you know, why you are that down? You know, what's you know what's wrong with you? You know?'" He said, "No, no, no, Shabir. Before we start, I wanted to ask you a question and I want an answer." I said, "Okay." He said, um, "When you use a toothpick, after you use the toothpick, that used toothpick, what do you do with it?" <laughs> okay. He asked me. Mm-hmm. So I said, "What kind of question is that?" So he looked at me and I said, look, why are you asking me this stupid question? He said, no, no, I need an answer. I said, first of all, if I you know, use a toothpick, I always put it in my dustbin. I'm not going to use it in the floor. He said, are you sure you, you don't throw it on the floor? I said, no, absolutely not. So he looked at me and said, even at your office? And I said, no. He said, Shubir, I asked this question before you came over here you know, to all my direct reports and also my secretary. And everybody said, they put it in the dustbin, a used toothpick. I said, okay. He said, here I am. I had a 6 a.m. in the morning in the meeting and w- with my boss, with my CEO, and he is definitely upset about our J.D. Power report, and I'm the vice president of quality. We've been doing this process improvement for so long, and you have been helping us. And after the toughest meeting, I'm, when I'm getting out, I saw a t- used toothpick on the floor. Maybe I did not notice it when I was going to his office, but... I, you know, noticed it when I, and there's a used toothpick on the floor. So I said, okay, so what do you do there? He said, I just pick it up and throw it in the dustbin. So I said, then what is the point? He looked at me, he said, Shubir, the point is, look, Shubir, I don't think it's anything with the process. It's about the people. Because I'm, if somebody is some executive coming to my CEO's office and use a, you know, got upset or whatever the reason, throw a toothpick on the floor, that means you might find thousands of toothpicks in all of our departments. So he used it as a metaphor, and I looked at him and I said, "You are right." He said, "Look, people doesn't have the caring mindset for this company." 
So well, when I mean, you look at the caring mindset, I mean, we <laughs> believe today that there is so much about the dog-eat-dog nature of competition that people just don't spend the time thinking yes. about uh, the health, the well-being of their own people. They're so busy with so many elements that are distracting them from caring about the people below. And many of us, Subir, believe me, have worked in institutions where we see really dysfunctional teams, processes, yes. management. Yes. I mean, is that the norm? What is the norm? I think I think the norm is basically, as you said, that that is a norm. It is it's literally that is became like a norm to a lot of companies, and that disturbs me. That is the reason I wanted to change that. You know, that's the reason I wrote this book. So, you know, so let me a little bit tell you about that caring mindset. So, what I came up with, there is a four human attributes that any human being can practice, and I call it as a star, like a S T A R. Is a stand for straightforward, thoughtful, mm -hmm. accountable and the result. So think about each of these words. A straightforward. Yeah, break it thoughtful. down for us. Right. A straightforward, thoughtful, and uh, accountable, and result. Can these four attributes, human attributes, any human being can practice? The answer is yes. The problem is that why they don't, why organization does not give that culture, but some organization do. But the reason is that, so for an example, so let me a little bit explain to you. Let me break it down. So for an example, the straightforwardness. If I talk about the straightforwardness, what I find, the major reason people are not as straightforward, even though that is the right thing to do, and my definition of it is straightforward, is much more like be honest, be a straight cut, don't hide anything. That type of mentality is very straight cut, you know. But the problem is organizations don't reward the straightforward people. <laughs> No, right? no, not it's at all. Honest, in many cases, but, everybody thinks they're the ones being left in the dark. Nobody tells us what's going on around here. Exactly. I can't even get an email that explains why this yes. policy has changed. I can't get a call back and, and from human what? resources. Because that, but because of that culture, those organizations have to the price, pay the price someday. Mm. And let me tell you wow, how. Think about Volkswagen. Volkswagen is one of the German, you know, not only the German icon is one of the automotive icon, and there's so many innovation came from there. They are one of the best in processes. And guess what happened? Volkswagen two years ago, they deliberately installed software to trick the regarding the emission stuff to 11 million vehicles to trick it intentionally. Yeah. Light. Mm -hmm. So that means their car light, right? Mm -hmm. They know their cars is not you know, generating the right emission the U.S. government wants. And they felt that they're out of smart, the U.S. government. Nobody can catch it. And they wrote this software so that, you know, to saying that, hey, they are meeting the emission standard. But ultimately what happened? Dishonest people, ultimately they got caught. So now what is the consequence? Not only they got the market share, tremendous amount of losing the market share around the world because of this, they are already paid Billions, more than $10 billion fine they only paid in U.S. They will be paying another billions of dollars in Europe, right? And rest of the consumer know that they are cheaters, right? Yeah, absolutely. What that tells you, right? Now, how that happened? Do you think that every employee in Volkswagen is dishonest? I don't think so. No, no. But there is some group of people who have done that. Because, now, why this happened? Why their people are not as straightforward? Why they are hiding? Two reasons. Number one, fear. And number two, a lot of the time, we are too proud, and we are too competitive. We wanted to get something at any cost. Why did anybody tell you to achieve something to by being an unethical, by of another human cost? The damage of this whole emission thing is much more to the mankind. And they didn't have any social responsibility for that? Well, it's amazing that you talk about that. I just saw a documentary on Warren Buffett when he was forced as the major investor in a financial services company to take it over because they had a scandal. And he went in front of Congress, and this was not something that Warren Buffett from Omaha liked to do. And he went in front of Congress and told them what he told the people in the company was, I want you to imagine 
that everything you're doing at this desk would be reported on the front page of your local newspaper? And how would you live with yourself? So exactly. that gets to that issue of straightforwardness. Exactly. 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 So think about this. What really even gives me even more pain? Cornell University did a study, and they found out white-collar crime, crime, white-collar crime, not blue-collar, white-collar crime, estimated cost to the United States $300 billion annually. Mm. $300 billion annually. White-collar crime. Think about what is the purpose of education. These are educated people. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and that is the point. So and and you know as you know you know I I wrote in the chapter a particular story that you know in fact I have a very favorite quote by Randy Posh. He passed away. You know he's a professor at Carnegie Mellon. Wrote a phenomenal book called The Last Lecture, and mm. he talked about it is it is interesting the secrets you decide to reveal at the end of your life, the secrets you decide to reveal at the end of your life. I, I talked about a particular story about Nick, and I, you read the book. You have seen yes. the guy, he d- diagnosed with cancer, oh. and and he got to the top of the position when he, he died. You know, at that time, he was the chief purchasing officer of a Fortune 500 company, and, um, he, um, and he was only 52 when he diagnosed, and, and he got to that position at any cost, right? So... He was one of the toughest, you know, not only toughest, some of the time he did something, you know, another human's cost, you know, like he did not promote to the people that who are talented. He never, he took all the credit from them and did all these things. And some of them left the company. He demoted the people who tried to do something, you know, on, on his way, you know, uh, to, you know. And now here he is. When he was diagnosed, the first thing he did, he contacted me and he talked with me, sat with me. And asking me, saying, that Shibir, can you teach me something? I said, what? He said, how can I earn forgiveness from other mm. human beings? I said, what do you mean by that? He said, Shibir, you know my whole career is built up on another human being's cost. You know what I did to Audrey. You know what I did to this. You know what I did to this person. And I said, look, I don't know any of that. But if you're asking me forgiveness, why it is important to you? He said, Shibir, I wanted to die with because i'm done you know doctors gave me only one month to live and i wanted to reach out to each of them and i wanted the forgiveness uh, i i so now think about that part even though he had the realization at the end and he ultimately survived for six more months but he did his everything in his power and i kind of only thing what i told him i said look what you should do you become a straightforward you talk from your heart you tell them that okay you is you did something so bad to them, you hurt their feeling. You, you know, everything. You just tell them straight from your heart. And he said, do you think that they will accept my call? I said, of course they will accept your call. But you tell them you're sincere. And initially they will think you are lying, you are faking, you might have another agenda. They may think that. But then you tell them that, no, the reason I'm reaching out, believe it or not, now I have the realization because I'm only one month to leave. Tell them. Wow, that's fascinating. And I'll- Shabir, you know, ultimately, you know, he, he talked about it, you know. Shabir, because we have so many things to get through, uh, you, you really gave us a, a wonderful uh, and deep understanding of this notion of straightforwardness. But in your star concept, which is part of the book that you've got to get, it's called The Difference, When Good Enough Isn't Enough. And uh, we are so fortunate today on America Trends to have Shabir Chowdhury with us. Thoughtfulness. Break that down for us. Okay, thoughtfulness is about. Um, I'm my my objective is not like thoughtfulness is very you know just to care for another human being, whoever the person would be. It can be the next door neighbor. It can be somebody in your family member. It can be um, you know someone in your workplace. The question is when think about this way. Every single day when each of us wake up, ask yourself a question. Very simple question. What can I do? Today, just only today, for one human being to give another human being some positive energy. Only one human being. Can I, what can I do? Any one of us, any, like all of your you know, listeners, mm-hmm. if each of them think, what is the one thing I can do for another human being that will give the happiness or something or positive impact to the another human being? That's it. It can be, it can be just put your hand 
on the shoulder of your next colleague and say, hey, you know, I saw you a little bit stressed. What's going on, my friend? Can I buy you a coffee? Yeah. Or can but does anybody really do that? I mean, and does that have to come from the top in an organization for it to work beautifully, to really mesh? I mean, where do we have to take these concepts and how vastly but well my, applied across the entire organization? But my feeling is this, though. The reason I wrote the difference, and I don't know. Now, ideally, you know, if you have a good leader and they adopt the book, and they talk about this, and they lead it every single day. That is phenomenal. Mm. But I kind of felt that, you know, chances of getting that leader to champion it, it would be very slim. It is not even 1%. So I rather, what, the, what I did on the, by writing the difference, mm-hmm. I'm trying to encourage them and inspire the common people and tell them, don't wait for leaders. Just do it yourself. Right. So and why I say that. So think about this way. You know, my next point about the accountability is a phenomenal Mother Teresa's quote. Mother Teresa used to say, do not wait for leaders. Do it alone. Do not wait for leaders. Do it alone. Think about that. Mm. When Mother Teresa said millions of people in the street of Calcutta in India, almost 99 percent of the people she saved, they are either Muslim or Hindu. They are not Christian. She didn't go to Catholic church and ask the question to the Pope and say, hey, you know, I'm saving all these Christians and uh, like uh, all the Hindus and Muslims, and I'm not forcing them to convert either. So is it okay? Should I save their life? She didn't care. Because her dream was to, hey, any human being, irrespective of their religion, is the, is the uh, gift of God. And we need to, I, it is in my power to save their life, if I can. So for hungry children or dying people, that's what she did. And rest is history. Ultimately, what happened after even her death, she became beautified very quickly and became a saint, right? So the question would be, you know, if you wanted to be thoughtful to somebody, then I felt that you, you can do it. Every human being, irrespective of your position, you have that. So I, one of the things I kind of emphasize on the, to become thoughtful is a two-step process. One of the first step is a listening. Second step is the empathy. Problem is that majority of the time we do not show our empathy of the another human being because we are not listening to them. What I mean by that? Listening is not just hearing. Listening is not just somebody is talking and you are just you know standing there and just hearing. Listening is when somebody talking about it. Are you putting on that person yourself? Have to put in that person's shoe to understand what he's talking about. That is listening. Once you are putting yourself on some other person's shoes, then your empathy kicks in, automatic. Trust me, it is like a magical. I'm not joking. You, if, you, if you go there and you felt there's a person is in charge, because see, every day when you wake up, you can look at a lot of things in negative way, a lot of things in positive way. But what I do, even the negative situation, I'm looking in a positive way. That is the way I taught my mind. Right? I'm looking at positive way. As soon as I see it as a positive way, even though I know they are trying to make me negative, but I'm still continuously turning into positive, guess what? Over time, they get converted. Okay, so these are the attributes that you consider key. So we have broken down straightforwardness, thoughtfulness, thoughtfulness. accountability. What about resolve? Resolve is, is, is all about that having the passion and determination and the perseverance to find a solution to a problem or improve the situation. Well, you and Angela Duckworth have really come to this. She writing the book, Grit. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, And she did a brilliant job on that. So let me give you some example on that. You know, a lot of the time I kind of feel to the people saying that, you know, I'm living in an organization, you know, it's very difficult for me to, you know, resolve that because there's a lot of other people involved. I said, no, 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 no. The question is that how badly you wanted to resolve something. If you deeply care for your organization, you can. Even if it's not your job, you still can make a difference. So she said, then they asked me a question. I said, let me tell you. I said, do you think that you are not smarter than a 13-year-old? When I asked that question, she said, what do you mean by that? I said, let me tell you a story. I said, Trisha Prabhu, her name is Trisha Prabhu. She is a 13-year-old girl from Illinois, right, in Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And in 2013, when she was 13-year-old, she was extremely angry and upset by reading an article in the Internet saying that an 11-year-old Florida girl was bullied by the classmates and committed suicide. 11-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. 
mm. committed suicide because bullied by the classmate so she trisha got really upset and she was saying you know what my age group people are dying and we have been hearing from adults so many time our teachers our parents everybody no oh, don't do cyber bullying blah 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 and everybody nothing is happening there is so many kids are dying committing suicide because of the cyber bullying so what can i do i have to resolve it i had enough i have to resolve it so that i don't need to read another 11 year old another 12 years old is dying so what she did she went to the research mode did a complete research long story short she came up with an app name rethink the app is called rethink mm. if you and once they install those app 93% of adolescent who used the app decided not to post any hurtful message after they had an opportunity to rethink see what happened is that the way the adolescent's mind mind is her research found the way their brain is developing still and the way it was designed is that when they are writing a nasty message or when they are doing something you know at that moment once they finish if you just suddenly tell them to stop or tell them are you sure you wanted to do this is is going to hurt somebody else's feeling so the what the rethink app does any bad words or any hurtful messages it automatically if you have that app automatically will figure it out and give you a suddenly it will give you a message saying are you sure you want to post this hurtful message this might hurt somebody else's feeling are you sure as soon as you do that adolescent brain immediately said oh my god yeah i should not do that i'm sorry boom they said no then they don't post it so 93% it reduced can you imagine that wow so there is a change that so, is palpable but i want to ask you speaking of change when you go into a company and you're assessing their culture and whether it's a caring culture how quickly can you tell if a company has that culture to succeed in a dramatic fashion like a hundred fold increase in sales versus ten fold what's the first telltale sign to you when you walk into a place so i think is the uh, you know the the way i kind of look at it is that as soon as i meet with the senior leadership team and also we do a cross functional also with the some employees and also with the middle manager and all those people in all level we kind of do a sampling and we just go there and we discuss if we see a consistent message across the from the top to the bottom right maybe within maybe two weeks or three weeks time frame similar message so for an example if i ask a question like hey you know <laughs> what's your company's value suppose i get the answer just to value tell me some few words two or three words you don't have to say mission statement and completely memorize it and no 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 just tell me what is the thing so suppose i tell ask that question in a lower level even in a assembly line worker level to all the way to the top level or in the middle level i ask and suppose i i'm getting the similar answer right somebody may say oh our company is a very honest company or our company is very ethical company it doesn't matter ethics and honesty go side by side right mm-hmm. and if i see that trend i know that this company's culture is uh, very strong and the other thing is that most of the time what we find is that lower level continuously praise about the higher level right if the company culture is very very strong on the same token that when you talk to the lower upper level when you are discussing with them they continuously talk about saying that hey look shubir you know it's not about uh we as a leader because leader's job th- this is the, i'm talking about the company ceo or company chief operating officer they are talking to me like you know it's not about us we are on the top but you know we are kind of an administrator but literally our company is run by our people at the end of the day is the our people they are the one who are the reason our company is so successful so instead of talking to us can you talk to them more as soon as they so that means the credit goes so when i go to the lower level and they continuously the praising about the leaders then you know this company's mindset is hey it's not about me it's about our colleagues the reason i'm becoming successful or my organization is doing good because of my colleagues not for me that kind of mentality i think that's what you have each of us have to think about we became so much of self centered in this fake culture and i'm very honestly i'm not quoting donald trump that he talked about fake news or whatever but i'm just talking about as a culture i think especially in the social media era it's not in america problem it's all over the world you know you know facebook is has a nickname called fake book right mm-hmm. and the reason is that because we are trying to continuously portray how great you are rather than think about how little we know how 
I can make it different. Every day when I wake up, the whole world thing, I'm one of the world's top management guru. Do you know what I feel about myself? I feel that, oh my God, I don't know anything. What can I learn from this colleague? You know, like even today I'm talking to you, you gave me two or three data, right? <laughs> right? When I'm kind of feel that, hey, you know, I, I'm talking to you, even though I talk more, but I still feel that maybe I should spend more time with you because I can learn. Because the reason I have a respect for you, because you might be spending so many, so many talented people, right? You know, you are interviewing them. On the process, you are enriching well, yourself. Uh, I've been so blessed you to, might, to speak you know, to people like you yes. over the years. But let me ask you, Subir, when somebody reads some of the materials that you put forward about yourself, talking about saving billions of dollars by deploying process improvement methodologies, so somebody might think that if they just read that, that you were coming in and trampling on human resources, and yet... They might be surprised when the real payoff in your book, The Difference, is a caring mindset. And some yes. might say that those two things uh, don't go together. That is the argument I'm making. Those are the two things go together. And without those two together, it will fail. So let mm. me tell you, what is the definition of quality? Definition of quality is all about combination of people power and the process power. Shame on me. I realized it after 20 years. And the sad part is all my mentor, Dr. Deming, Dr. Taguchi, all those people, they talked about it, and they wrote so many books about it. Everything concentrated on the process side, not on the people side. Ah. So what I'm trying to do is that saying that, no, you cannot achieve the highest number of process, you know, the best of the best processes. unless. And let me tell you why. So somebody used my process. So the, what is the difference between a 10x company and a 100x company? The company which is a 100x company, suppose I teach them, t taught them a methodology and they understand the process improvement methodology. Do you know what that organization people will do? They will say, after I finish that, after I taught them how to do a project and I coach them how to finish that, and suppose on a project they saved a quarter million dollars, then they will say, oh my God, this tool really work. I don't care what my boss says. All my project, I'll start this principle. And then other projects, they automatically do on their own. They apply some of the principle. And then the next project, they save maybe another 150000 Next project, they may save another 100000 On the other company, the 10x return, first of all, they came to the class because their boss told them to. So mm -hmm. they, they don't have any belief in this. And then after they took the class, even suppose you help them, and they suppose save on the project, a money because their mind is not there. They're, they don't have the right mindset. So what they do, even if it worked, they wash their hand. They said, hey, what the heck, I don't care. So that is one of the reasons all these methodologies, Six Sigma, TQM, and all these methodologies, they, they did not stick. So, the, and so what American organization think? They think, oh, my God, oh, Shubir is writing a new book. Oh, let's talk about that one. Okay, <laughs> then they bring me in again for another process. So, for an example, I wrote a book on Six Sigma, and it became very popular, and as soon as five years later, I know that, okay, Americans are impatient, and now Six Sigma is failing. Then they said, okay, all right, then I introduced another book called Leo, like Listen and Reach Optimize. That is a process. Nothing to do with the people. Then they, they, they immediately hired me. They said, okay, maybe the Leo will help. I did the Leo. So after five years of Leo, then I'm saying, wait a minute. Why this organization? You know, what is the reason? It's nothing to do with the process. Maybe we have to fix the people fast before they do the process. Because who will use the process? is the people. So unless, see, what I'm saying now, it sounds philosophical, but I sincerely mean it. If you wanted to achieve quality, you have to have a quality mindset. And do you if think you, you finally quality, reached what you consider now to be uh, the universal truth about yes. why companies can succeed? Yes, absolutely. I have zero doubt. Because, and, and not only that, the, the amazing part is if you personally go, um, even in my LinkedIn page, you know, that you just type should be Chowdhury or whatever and author difference, and I posted two of the chapters, uh, one of them, uh, it's called The Power of a Glass of Water. That is a story I wrote there. It's about a thoughtful story. And another story is about that Nick I talked about, this chief purchasing officer dying on the cancer, that story I shared with you. That one is called The Power of Honesty and being in a state, why a straightforwardness is matter, right? I posted those two articles. You cannot even believe. Each article is liked by 15,000 people, all, you know, 350,000 people visiting the stuff. And you should read all the comments. If you read all the comments, you will be, and all over the world, people are so hungry now for thoughtfulness because people are also kind of tired of this, 
you know, all this social media and so much of gadget-centric life. And I think, I think it is time people want another person's human touch. You know, even if I go to the lunch break now, you know, to big corporation and all this, do you know what I see? You go to a lunch break in the past, 20 years ago, people are talking to each other, they're laughing, they're smiling, they're looking at each other. Now, everybody's looking at their iPhone and iPad. That's it. Yeah. Are management consultants like you, who've not reached uh, this ultimate to truth, and business schools, are they really sending out into the world or preparing people anew uh, to handle these circumstances? Or are they really amiss in terms of the way that they're approaching uh, better competitiveness and uh, more productivity? I, look, I don't want to... Um bad not about my own profession or whatever, but that itself is the problem. Because the sad part is that in our society, people became so much, so much of, um, I should say it as a much more like a financial centric or money, money hungry, right? Rather than so a lot of the time, they kind of lose their focus. So a lot of the consultants, you know, even my own profession, they just go after that, hey, at any cost, how I can make more money from the client. They're not thinking about what value I'm bringing in. Why my clients? See, every day when I wake up, when my client said, okay, Shabir, you already we already achieved $2 billion number. I said, no, that's not enough because there's another $5 billion that still we can save. Why don't we target that? It's not perfect yet. Are you telling me everything you're doing is perfect? See, so I, I strongly feel, and, and, and so that is the consultant perspective, and I strongly feel, and a lot of the time, even, even Six Sigma and all this stuff, the reason it failed, because as soon as the methodology become popular, like think about it, I talked about a star, I bet on you as soon as it become popular, guess what will happen? Thousands of consultants will use the same thing, then it lose the shine, you know, then it lose, and they're not practicing it properly. I don't have any problem somebody take the methodology, reading the book, and develop something and applying it correctly. I don't have any issue with that. But I have a major issue when they're not using it properly because that damaged the subject. So that is on the consultant side. On the, on the university or the MBAs and all this, what my I, – I, and I think they improved a lot after the financial crisis. They improved a lot with respect of because that is a big lessons learned for them. And they have also seen a lot of the, during the financial uh, you know, crisis time, lots of the people, white-collar crime, um, you know, uh, happen by the people who are Ivy League MBAs. I'm very honest with you. I'm not mm-hmm. picking on them, but that is a fact. Okay, it's, it's a data-driven. Um, like, there is a book, in fact, written by Harvard Business School professor uh, Clayton Christensen that how will you measure your life, you know? How will you measure your life? You know, that is a question, and she, he talked about that, you know, some certain percentage of his classmate of Harvard Business School end up in jail, right? Mm. And that gave him the inspiration that what he's doing, you know, he should teach this to the MBAs. So I think if the universities, um, students and everything, I think, you know, if they can do a little bit more practical, because it's not about bookish, it's about the practical. So everything I wrote on that book is 100% of true story of my client story. Those are real life stories. And not only that, plus I also talked about my family life stories, my own shortcomings. Like I talked about, you know, how I, I as an individual have struggled for, you know, being thoughtful with my daughter, you know, my, um, you know, teenage daughter, or, you know, how, who are the people really made an impact and made a difference in my life. And I, I did not pick even a single person from my professional life. I, there is only three person uh, came out. The reason why I became what I became is because of my grandfather and my father and mother, right? And, and, and the funny thing is, all three of them are the poorest of the poor financially. But mentally, they are amazingly rich people because some of the things they put in my DNA is, you know, it's amazing. And at that time, I didn't appreciate and now I became older. Now I'm realizing, oh, my God, the contribution they made is amazing. It's not a financial contribution. Right, I understand. Fully. You know? Shabir Chowdhury, I can't thank you enough for sharing and giving people just a sense of what they are going to find when they read The Difference, when good enough isn't enough. And if people want to read more about you and they want to follow some of the writings and uh, some of your uh, thought process as we move along, how can they do that? They can find uh, in uh, two places. My organization website is called asiusa.com, um, and my um, my personal website is shubhichowdhury.com. Is spelled S-U-B-I-R-C-H-O-W-T 
H-U-R-Y dot com. Or at Shubit Chowdhury is my uh, my uh, Twitter account, and anybody can tweet me, and, and I'm pretty try my level best to respond. Everybody. Thank so, you so much for coming on America pleasure. Trends today. Thanks so much for featuring me. Our pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay,